General William Tecumseh Sherman scorched a path of destruction across Georgia that ended with the capture of Savannah. In December 1864, Sherman offered the port city to President Lincoln as a Christmas gift. Union victory was near. The general took for his headquarters the mansion of one of the city's wealthiest cotton merchants. He celebrated with his officers, feasting on native oysters and turtle soup. On the outskirts of the city, thousands of emancipated slaves were gathered. They had followed Sherman's army to Savannah, doubling the city's population. In the book of Revelations it is written that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And this is interpreted as that moment where God in his omnipotence has now come to deliver his people from bondage. It came so sudden on them they wasn't prepared for it, recalled one liberated slave. Just think of whole droves of people that had hardly ever left the plantation, turned loose all at once with nothing in the world but the clothes on their back. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had freed slaves across the South. But Washington still had no clear plan for what to do once African Americans were free. On January 11th, President Lincoln sent his Secretary of War, Edwin M. Stanton, to Savannah. Stanton instructed General Sherman to set up a meeting with some of the city's black ministers. He wanted to hear how the freedmen imagined their future in the South. That evening, 20 black men entered the Grand Parlor as guests of Stanton and Sherman. 16 were former slaves. They chose Reverend Garrison Frazier, who had purchased his freedom nine years earlier, to be their spokesman. For the first time, federal officials conferred with freed slaves about the future of African Americans in the South. The exchange that occurs between Sherman, Stanton, and the Union generals, and Reverend Frazier, is one of the extraordinary moments of the Civil War and the ending of the Civil War. Because they asked Frazier not just what should we do with all these refugees, they asked him questions about what the war meant. They asked him questions about what the Emancipation Proclamation had meant. They asked him what the presence of black troops in the Union Army meant. And in many ways you'll find no better definition of the meaning of the Civil War and the kinds of answers that Garrison Frazier gives that day in Savannah. The freedom as I understand it, promised by the Emancipation Proclamation, is taking us from under the yoke of bondage and placing us where we could reap the fruit of our own labor. To be a slave, as one of these ministers pointed out to General Sherman, was to be someone who had no control over his life's decisions. And now, these people feel the need to express their abilities, their choices. The way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land. And we can soon maintain ourselves and have something to spare. We want to be placed on land until we are able to buy it and make it our own. This was a man who never left probably coastal Georgia in his life. But he understood the Declaration of Independence. He understood the Emancipation Proclamation. And beyond that, he said, in effect, you should give us our rights and you should protect our rights. And then you should leave us alone and let us be citizens. Four days later, anxious to get thousands of freed slaves off his hands and Washington off his back, General Sherman issued Special Field Order 15. 
It was only a temporary order, but it became one of the most controversial of the Civil War. Plantations in the rice country had been abandoned by white planters during the war. 400,000 of these acres would be given over to African Americans for settlement. The huge land tract included the Sea Islands and parts of the Georgia and South Carolina coast. Forty acres of land will be given out to each family. Plus, Sherman says, the Army's got tons of mules, which we don't really need. They're broken down from our long march. If anyone wants a mule, they can have one of these mules. This is the origin of that famous phrase, 40 acres and a mule. For four million African Americans in the South, news of 40 acres and a mule spread as fast as the contagion of freedom itself. Many saw this as proof that emancipation would finally give black men and women a true stake in the land they had toiled on for centuries. Even as Lee surrendered to Grant, scores of newly emancipated men and women were arriving at St. Catharines in the Sea Islands of Georgia. Under Sherman's Field Order 15, these abandoned lands would be theirs. Leading them was 53-year-old Tunis G. Campbell from New Jersey. For years, Campbell had worked tirelessly as an abolitionist, a preacher, an educator, and political organizer. With the help of Secretary of War Stanton, Campbell got himself appointed superintendent for the Union-occupied islands in Georgia. There are a lot of people in 1865 who are trying to tell blacks what freedom is and tell them what they ought to be doing. Campbell reflects the impulse, we should really determine ourselves what we're doing. Independence from white control, that's critical to their definition of what freedom is. It just happens that on St. Catherine's Island, you can create such a thing. The whites have all fled, Sherman has given out land, so the opportunity to create an independent black community exists. We left with rations and a few families, and at Hilton Head got more. Campbell wrote, and Savannah loaded us as deep as we could swim. These deserted lands had been at the heart of the South's rice-growing empire. As Campbell arrived to the island and they put the gangplank down, the island was overgrown. It's been looted by Union naval forces. The seagrass is high. There are rattlesnakes. There are alligators. He can see the slave cabins. They're also in great disrepair. Immediately upon arriving and assessing the situation there, he writes to the American Missionary Association, asking for seed, asking for plows, sweet potatoes to supplement the diet, marriage licenses for the people, and he calls a meeting of the people to explain to them, this is our home. Uh, uh, beginning next week, I will divide up the land into 40 acres for each of you. By June, the settlers had crops in the ground. I have corn, watermelons, citron, onions, radishes, and squash, wrote Campbell. But the rebels have destroyed the sweet potatoes. Do not fail to send them. Send eight number 11 plows, six cultivators, get the improved ones. Tunis Campbell sees the South as a kind of new political frontier. Sees himself as a kind of political pioneer to go to that place where this new regime of black political liberty and civil liberty might flourish. Campbell arrived at St. Catharines with his own blueprint for a government. There would be a Congress with eight men in the Senate and 20 in the House of Representatives, a Supreme Court, and Campbell himself as president. He even established a 275-man militia. Order said Campbell, 
is heaven's first law. So you've got this tiny little island, 12 miles long, three miles wide, and a government set up to resemble the United States government with a Supreme Court at the top. It's a wonderful, what beautiful uh, experiment in, in democracy. And people took to it very well. They liked the idea of having the power to select their leaders and remove them. On St. Catherine's Island, Tunis Campbell's township was flourishing. Three hundred and sixty-nine settlers occupied fifty-four slave dwellings left from the old days. They grew fruits and vegetables of all kinds. But what they wanted were schools. There is one sin that slavery committed against me that I will never forgive, remembered one man. It robbed me of my education. Before the Civil War, maybe no more than 10 to 15 percent of the black population of the South was literate. To learn how to read was a revolutionary act. They understood that it was necessary if they were to take their place as freed people within the Union, that they have the rudiments of education to survive. After the war, freedmen who had secretly educated themselves quickly opened schools in warehouses, on barges, even in old slave markets. And the Freedmen's Bureau and Northern missionaries built thousands more throughout the South. At St. Catharines, Campbell used his own savings to bring teachers down from the North. Then he called on his wife, Harriet, in New York. He writes a letter to Harriet, says, bring the sons down. Uh, we're going to establish the schools. We're on an island of our own. There are no white people here, and we're going to, to lift up uh, children. Uh, bring all the primers you have, and please join us. This is the first time he's seen his wife and sons uh, in about two years. Harriet and Tunis taught side by side with northern teachers. Campbell reported that 80 children and adults on St. Catharines and 60 on nearby Sapelo Island were enrolled in schools. More than a thousand students attended Campbell's makeshift academies. The adults are being taught at night. They need to deal with white people more as equals. And to do that, they have to be literate. White planters watching from the mainland resented the schools and the entire settlement. Not just because the land had been seized from one of their own, but because of Campbell's ambition and independence. People like Campbell were viewed as black people out of their place. He can think for himself in ways that whites find hard to believe that a black person could think. This means then that history has somehow spun out of control. By June 1865, Jacob Waldberg, the white planter who had owned St. Catharines, was back in Georgia. He demanded that Campbell get off his land. The planters are holding up deeds to the islands that are 200 years old or 150 years old. They said, no, wait a minute. Uh, this is a nation of laws, and see, my great-granddaddy had this deed. And yours comes from a possessory title given to you in time of war for abandoned lands. How does that affect my promise of property rights under the Constitution of the United States? Waldberg got his answer. St. Catherine's Congress passed a law forbidding any white person from setting foot on the island. Campbell's militia stood ready to enforce it. The president ordered that Confederate lands seized by Union troops during the war be returned to the planters. 
including land confiscated under General Sherman's Field Order 15. In Georgia, the assistant commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau refused to give planters back their land. Johnson fired him and replaced him with someone who would. In Washington, the head of the Bureau, General O. O. Howard, sympathized with the freedmen and resisted the president's decree for as long as he could. Finally, in October, Howard set out for the black settlement at Edisto Island off the coast of South Carolina. His orders from President Johnson were to effect an agreement mutually satisfactory to the freedmen and the landowners. Behind the bureaucratic language, Johnson's directive was clear. General Howard has to tell these former slaves that the land that they thought had been given to them by the federal government now is going to be given back to the former owners. And if they want to remain there, they're going to have to sign labor contracts to work as laborers on these plantations. Wrote one man, you ask us to forgive the landowners of our island. The man who tied me to a tree and gave me 39 lashes, who stripped and flogged my mother and my sister, and will not let me stay in his empty hut, except I will do his planting and be satisfied with his price? That man I cannot well forgive. In January 1866, a large contingent of black soldiers arrived at St. Catharines with orders to restore the land to Jacob Waldberg. Campbell's militia had kept whites off the island, but this was something different. Tennis Campbell believed that the people had to take things into their own hands sometimes, but African-American freed men are not going to fire on African-American soldiers. No. The experiment in independence at St. Catharines was over. <laughs>